Hello and a very warm welcome to Gelato's Parlour. Now, on this episode, we got a very special guest and I've spent so long trying to get this guy, trying to pin him down because he's extremely busy all the time and he's uh, he can be an elusive sod as well. It's uh, one of my best mates, Mr. Leo Green. How are you, pal? So I was just being elusive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, good, how are you? That was a great start. Yeah, that, that's him all over. But I'll just introdu- uh, introduction to, to Leo, if those who don't know who he is, which I'd be very surprised. Um, he's worked with such greats. Uh, he's a great saxophone player, so he's worked with such greats as Van Morrison, Jerry Lee Lewis. Who else, mate? Come on, I can't remember. Well, um... I've got a CV that makes me sound like I'm 85 years old because I've got, <laughs> got to play with a lot of people who unfortunately are no longer with us. But uh, yeah, when I was 18, they're I started They're no longer off, with anybody. Well, that's what they tell me because they're not <laughs> returning my calls. But I started off with uh, with Jerry Lee Lewis and uh, he still is around and I spent two years with him. Uh, then I did some stuff with Jeff Beck and then, uh, as you say, I joined Van Morrison when I was about 20, 21. Did uh, eight or nine years with him. Then uh, moved on, did some time, a couple of years with Jules Holland. Uh, playing with lots of people in between, did a, a couple of tours with Lisa Stansfield, who was lovely, uh, some things with Marty Pello, and just, you know, the phone goes, uh, I've got a figure to maintain, and those restaurant <laughs> bills don't pay themselves, so off I go, you know. But, mate, um, unbelievably, right, <laughs> Leo's career is, is, he's told you when he's done all these star study things, and we'll, we'll come to that in a minute, but he's also uh, an entrepreneur, he's put on the Blues Festival. How many years have you done that, mate? Uh, this is our 10th year, so we started off, uh, in clubs like the 100 Club and the Jazz Cafe and uh, we've moved along we then went to Shepherd's Bush and Hammersmith and the Royal Albert Hall we've ended up uh, this is we've done about four or five years down at the O2 for three nights which you've graced the stage down there with us well I graced the stage when it was at the Albert Hall you did yeah yeah it was really nice with all the it was a fantastic thing there because it was all the little rooms all That's the off right, rooms yeah lovely lovely so he, yeah but, he's, he, but you've done you've done so much mate honestly just 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 these are just introduction really before we get onto the juicy stuff <laughs> but also Leo was uh, he, he, he took over Ronnie, the running of Ronnie Scott's when uh, right, Pete yeah. King well, well when Pete King sold it yeah right yeah. and we can get onto that but you also the, the current thing you're doing is the Leo Green Orchestra with great artists like Beverly Knight and yeah, uh, these that's, right, yeah. Yeah, it's, that's been fun it's something I didn't really expect to happen but uh, the last couple of years we've done uh, a lot of different projects for Radio 2 celebrating great songbooks so we've done, as you say, one with Beverly singing the Stevie Wonder stuff. We did uh, uh, one with the Melda May doing a lot of Celtic stuff. We did Tom Chaplin from Keen doing uh, the Freddie Mercury Queen stuff. So it's, that's been fun. What about the Black? You're doing Black Tony Blackbird as well on the road, don't you? Yeah, we're, we're going around with a smaller band, eight-piece band. Uh, we're taking his radio show sounds of the sixties around the theatres. He talks about what he was up to in the sixties. So it's not it's not boring. It's not about and in nineteen sixty three and so and so recorded this. He talks about the pirate ships and starting Radio One and, and then we play a lot of songs, which is great fun. But you know, mate, you know, I've known you for so many years, and we can get into that in a minute. But for, for, for a guy, you, so Leo, you've got four kids. Apparently, right? yeah, you've got four kids. Yeah, there was four when I left and the house this morning. That's right. <laughs> and, I, and I, you've, you've got to get this all the time on this on this gelato's pilot with it. But I'm so glad to have you on because the, the point is, you, you just got boundless energy, and I don't know how you do it. Entrepreneur, saxophone player, band leader, you're putting all these people on. It's, uh, it's you know, the, the business needs needs people like you. You know, it's it's, it's amazing what you're you're uh, you're driving. Mm-hmm. All, you know. Well, I, I guess it's this is a result of what happens if you don't pay attention at school. I mean, when people say to me, "Oh, hello, I'm so and so. Who are you?" and I say, "I'm Leo," they say, "Oh, what do you do?" I never know what to say. You know, you you meet people at the kids' school and the parent evening, and I never know what to say. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, <laughs> and that's the truth. I still don't know. No. You know? And we didn't mention as well. That obviously, you know, uh, well, well, we'll get to it in a minute how we met. But um, your, your your dad was the great Benny Green, a fantastic broadcaster as well. That's you right. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, who, who, who I've got to know Benny very very well through for our relationship yeah i remember it but just just quickly but while we while we got there how did how did you and i meet what happened oh well there's a story it's a dover street wine bar wasn't it we, yeah. Uh, yeah i was about uh, i think i was 18 it was a summer i left school and i just started working with a band called tiger lily at dover street which at the time used to have a lot of swing and r&b bands and uh i was coming down the stairs and there was a picture on the wall of a bloke jumping in through the air with a saxophone and i said i was with my brother i said who's that he went that's a bloke called Ray Gelato. And an oversized suit, wasn't it? He, well, I didn't want to say, <laughs> but yeah. He said, that's a guy called Ray Gelato. And I said, Ray Gelato. And as I come down the stairs and said your name, you, there you were sitting there with, with some people. And my brother went, oh, that's him over there. I went, oh, right. What's he doing? And then he, my brother told me. And uh, so I think a mutual friend introduced us. 
and then you said to me, you sat and you heard the gig, and you said, well, I'm doing a gig tomorrow night at the bass cliff, you said, come along and sit in. Wow. And, so and I went along and sat in. And the bass cliff was in Oxford, <coughs> wasn't it? That's right, it's not, not no longer there. Like it's a Jack the Ripper Street. Well, it was a lovely club, wasn't it? It was a oh, nice, nice rooms. But um, you said, come and sit in, I went and sat in, and we played a few tunes, and we just... Wow. Kind of go on, didn't we? Do you know, but the thing is, yeah, but the, I'd heard about you. Someone said there's this young Brian, guy. What's your game? They it? said there's this young guy that looks like a younger version of you, right? Because people often think we're brothers. Hugh, Hugh who? Hugh, you. Oh, you. me. I'm you or you're me? Hugh Grant. <laughs> and, like, and they said, great guy, great saxophone player, he's amazing. So I popped out and saw you, and I was just, not joking, astounded by the, the energy uh, of, of what you did and the, the playing. And then when I knew you were Benny's boy, you know, it was amazing. But the other point is the, uh, the sound. You, yeah. you, 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 you've always had this like huge, deafening, <laughs> fantastic it's, sound. You yeah, know. it's I, your trademark that sound. I, I never thought anything about it. I never planned to have that sound. I just, you know, I'd grown up listening to certain records that had certain saxophone players on who made big sounds. And I think I, when I first started doing gigs at sort of 15, 16, it was with a lot of rock bands in local pubs where I, where I grew up, and there, there wasn't any monitoring. It was like a couple of speakers out front. And you've got two guys going at it on the guitars, and so you had to be loud, otherwise, yeah. You, yeah. you know, we can't hear you, there's no point in you being here, you're not going to get paid. But so. it's not just loud, it's rich and uh, fantastic. I've always gone for that sort of sound myself, although maybe a bit of an earlier version, but yeah. you always remind me of, of Clarence Clemens, who you've, you, yeah. you, 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 yeah. you know, you don't copy it, but that's simply who you've, you've played with. We actually, tell, just tell him the little story well, about Clarence Clemens. I'll, We've got hundreds of these I'll, stories. I'll take it back before take that story, back. actually, because the guy that that I was obsessed with as a kid and listened to the record, the same record all the time was was a guy called Big J McNeely well, sure. who you know and we saw him play together yeah. absolutely and uh, and he was the guy uh, who, who Clarence Clemens was, was, was hugely influenced by it all comes from the same place and uh, I can remember again I must have been 20 or 21 I don't know how I ended up but I was in a hotel with you uh, <laughs> this story's going to go another way now and there we were knocking on the door to, to meet Big J McNeely. That's because right. I don't know how I brought him over to do some gigs at Underground. That's right. So, you know, you were one of the few people in London who knew who Big J was. That's, well, just to backtrack a little bit, he was the guy that came out of... He was the, the uh, opposite to Bebop because he, he, he grew up with Charlie Parker and those guys, didn't he? That's and right, and, yeah. and uh, Illinois Jacquet and those great saxophone players. And he decided to go... It, what he did was almost like the punk rock of, of, of jazz. It really was. It really was. Incredible sound. He was a honker, wasn't he? Powerful. The first swinging, of the honkers. Yeah. Swinging, playing. He, yeah. was, he was the first guy to get off the stage and walk the That's bar right. and walk around the That's room. Right. which was Like a rock star in his day, wasn't it, he? It was, but it was what Louis Armstrong had been doing way back in New Orleans years before. Sure. And he, and he beca- but anyway, go, go tell him the, 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 the big J, and then the, the, it will lead to the Clarence story of when we... Yeah, so many Clarence things, Clarence. I'm not sure if we can say. I can't, you know, can we say what we saw when we went in that room? Well, we probably shouldn't. <coughs> Maybe we should save that for part two. Well, did, say, go on, go on. <laughs> I can't make no, 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 no. <laughs> I think he's still alive. Well, what a player. No, what Jay, a, Jay passed away about... A, he died about a year ago, he's amazing, but he didn't have his... Uh, well, one, he didn't have his, his wig on, did he? <laughs> well, that? That's what I heard. And it wasn't that... All I'll say, listen, yeah. is it, it, it wasn't just the wig he wasn't wearing no it was quite no. a revealing <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, when the door opened there was uh, yeah. a very proud man in front of us let's there, just say that there was but he had no shame but what a what a sweet guy wasn't he McNeely what well, a he, sweet guy he was encouraging res- guy he was responsible for my entire career and I'll tell you why people people say oh you know you only got what you got because of your dad and you know he must have opened doors and that really wasn't the case no, no, I, no. I t- I'll tell you exactly what happened is um, I, I, you know I'd grown up hearing these records I saw Big J was coming to London to play the Jazz Cafe and uh, it was in the middle of my A-levels, and I scooted off one afternoon. I went up there, and I thought, I mean, this is how naive I was. I thought, I'll ask him for a lesson. And I went along in the afternoon, and I said, look, can I have a lesson? And he said, well, I don't really give lessons, he said, but, you know, just play me a few things, and I played a few things. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, look, why don't you come back tonight, and you can sit in with us? I thought, great. I was so naive and young. I went back. At quarter to eight, the band said to me, look, we don't know where Big J is, but word has reached us. He's in the hotel, stuck in the shower with an air stewardess. You're going to have to go on for it. <laughs> so this is a true story. So I thought, okay, fine. I was, I was so naive. I went on and I played a few 12-bar blues. And about five minutes into it, in walks Big J. And I see him looking at me. And he was nodding his head and smiling. And he got up and we played together. Then I got off and he did his show. And he said to me at the end of the night, you do the next two nights with me. You can open the show for me. 
Which venue was that again? The Jazz Cafe. The Jazz Cafe, right. And in the audience that night were a couple of people from a London R&B band who were looking for the sax player, and that's how I got my start. From it was day. all from th that one night. I can trace the whole thing back. Do, do you know what, mate? That's incredible, because what you've just said, about ten, must have been ten years before that, I approached Big J when he first came, I think it was his first time ever in London. He told me about you. Right. He was at the 100 Club. You owe him money. I owe him money. <laughs> he was at the 100 Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to see him. There was him, I think that other guy, Chuck Higgins oh, yeah. and whatever. Oh, uh, great and, player, and, yes. and he was, and some other blues singer, but I can't remember who it was, they bought over a package. With yeah. Stuff. He used to do, there was the money in those days to do packages. Yeah, right. So they were doing this package, Big J, Chuck Higgins and... I can't remember. I'll think of the other guy in a minute. He was a great R&B, the you know, black wow. guy from the R&B. Yeah. Now, I asked Big J for lessons as well. And he wow. says, meet me next morning at the Camden uh, Music Machine. No, 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 no. What was it called? The Electric Ballroom in Camden. Right. And I'm right. rehearsing with a band. So I turn up and there's Nick Pentelo, yeah. Frank Mead, those sax. They were in the section, those lovely British guys at the time. I was young. Yeah. And Big J did the same thing. He sat down with me for an hour. Yeah. He says, what do you know? So I played. That's a pretty good sound. And you know what he said to me? He goes, what you've got to get is the vibrato. He right. goes, get a metronome. Yeah. Put it on the beats. And, and, and it was amazing. So we had a similar... Isn't that far? I didn't uh, know that. Yeah. No, absolutely true. But so, go, so Leo and I basically had a, a very fantastic but strange evening with... With Clarence Clemens. T say, say that we one. Did. We did. We've had a few. I'm trying to think uh, which one I'm allowed to repeat. Clarence was... Uh, how did I end up meeting Clarence? I, I was involved with the fit in a film with Lisa Stansfield. I was playing on the soundtrack called Swing. And Clarence was a character in this movie. He was playing the part of a, of a sax player. And we just got talking one day in, in the canteen. And we we got on. He was he's quite similar to you. He, he loves talking about saxes and horns. And, and we became friends. And he said to me... You know, a few things happened, and it turned the clock forward. And he's living in London, living in South London, and married to an English woman. So we used to go out occasionally and hang out. We had some very funny evenings. Excuse me, he was living in London at the time. He was Clarence? living in Wimbledon. Yeah, <laughs> he married an English woman from Miami to Wimbledon. Yeah, right? I mean, from the beaches of Florida to, to, to Wimbledon. And he lived in this in this flat. And I <laughs> go out there once for a party. He said, "I'm going to put this CD on. You're going to love it." And he put my CD on. I was so embarrassed. No, you know, well, you shouldn't have been. But uh, yeah. anyway, so we. Um, we recorded together, yeah. we, had, we had a wonderful time. And we would, would go out in the evening, and I remember saying to you, come along, we're going to take Clarence, we're going for ribs. You phoned me up. We're going to go for ribs. You should get your ass down here. And we're yeah. going to go to a couple of clubs, and we had... Uh, <laughs> Can we say it or not? <laughs> we had uh, a, a, an interesting night. We had an interesting night. I mean, yeah. all I remember about Clarence was he, he was... One, he was huge, Yeah. right? Two, he was a really, really nice guy. He was massive. Oh, biggest sweet, human being I've ever man, seen. Sweet man, though, not he? Sweet man, he loved what you did. And three... He bought out, where we went to this club, he cracked out a big uh, um, leather pouch of cigars. And you and I loved cigars in those, those days like we still do. And he never bloody offered us one. Do you remember Each that? one was the size of a like, French Each baguette, one, do you remember? And he never offered the it cigar. It would have taken us two hands just to lift it up. I oh, know. But that's it. Yeah, so we with the Clarence. But I was just thinking, there was another a, a couple of stories. Because we can get to our stories in a bit. But what was the other story with the big well-known... Uh, no, the Norman Grant story. Tell them that. Obviously, I'm thinking of all these things. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what happened, right? But, <laughs> do you remember that? The, the Vaguely, yeah, yeah. So, so Leo's dad, Benny, was uh, used to write the sleeve notes. He, he, among his other achievements, as a great author and uh, a radio broadcaster and TV presenter. And I say I got to know, got to be very friendly with Benny. He was a gentleman, absolute wonderful guy. I like, oh, loved your dad, yeah, you know. Sweet. But I just remember that. Um, so Benny used to write sleeve notes for Pablo Records, didn't he? And a lot of the, well, a lot Verve, of albums. And Verve, that's right, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and Verve, yeah, who was owned by Norman Grants, who was the biggest jazz impresario, wasn't he? Yeah. Now, Norman Grants used to tour Ella Fitzgerald, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie. He, he managed Oscar Peterson. Yeah, and he, he, you say it. Funny yeah. enough, he was my sister's uh, godfather. Right. Now, tell us just a little about Norman Grants when you were a kid. You met him, Well, it's yeah? a funny thing. Listen, as a kid, he was just one of my parents' friends who... You know, it's like you'd see him four times a year and, you know, yeah. hello, how are you? And haven't you grown? It was one of them. I didn't know who he was. Right. But all I knew is that every Christmas, I mean, Norman obviously lived in America and then he later on lived in Switzerland. But every year, these Christmas presents would arrive from <laughs> Uncle Norman and Auntie Greta. And they were like ridiculous presents. I was 10, 11 years old at the time. And yeah. And the very first Sony Walkman, you know, four of them turned up for the four kids, you know, and... Uh, 
with, oud, with like a box of cassettes and yeah. it was just the most generous But we're presence. talking here, aren't we, about the biggest jazz impresario yeah. ever yeah. and there'll never be anyone like him. No, he was the first guy to take jazz from the clubs into concert halls. Yeah. He paid guys. He wouldn't put up with any kind of racial segregation. There you go. Uh, they travelled the yeah. south. There was He, he, w- he wouldn't have... He'd ever. have the black and white musicians together. He was colour And he wouldn't them. let any audiences be segregated. Uh, you know, if, if they wanted to hear Ella Fitzgerald or Oscar, it had to be a mixed audience. He was the yeah. first guy to do that, yeah. and he was the first guy also who said, you know, all the black artists have to stay in the same hotels yeah. as the whites. I'm not having any of it. And he was uh, real proud I'll tell you what, he should get some more credit for that now, because it's a shame that that gets forgotten a little bit. And do you know one of his best pals was? Who was that? Picasso. Are oh, you kidding, really? Wow. Picasso. So he, he had all these sketches. Yeah. I mean, they're probably in a museum somewhere now. You That's know, unbelievable. Incredible guy, amazing guy. But the normal, so so this is the magnitude of, of this guy, right? And I I know about Norman Grants because I loved all the the Verve records with Oscar Peters and Ella Fitzgerald. I love that. So I'm lying on my sofa one night. Long, not with me. Long, not with him. No, no, no. A long time ago, <laughs> having a bit of a chill out, and I'm thinking I I can't. And I get the phone, and it's him. It's Leo calling. He goes, "Hey, Ray, what are you doing?" I says, "I'm re- relaxing." He goes, "He goes, uh, guess what?" I says, "What?" He goes, "Norman Grants is down this club." with my dad and my mum right? and I'm playing a gig he goes get your ass down here and play with me I said Norman Grant I said, I said, this is winding me up no way he goes no honestly Norman Grant says, I get in the shower I put my suit on get my sacks get down to this club now what was it called that club Palookaville opposite Covent Garden Station yeah. And we all used to do it two or three times a month. It was right. one of those gigs that it wasn't great money, but we all loved playing it's there. The training ground, wasn't it? They left you alone, you three forty five minute sets, play what you like. And that's the, that was where I learned some of the tunes and you know, met so, some lovely guys. But I get down there and indeed Benny's there. I says, Hello Benny and Leo's mum, who I, I knew his you know, we've I've grown up, we love his family, we're friends. And Norman Grants <laughs> is sitting there. <laughs> So Leo says, get your horn out, and we played. What well, were we playing? We a couple did. of tunes, We did we? Slow yeah. Boat, we did Lady, Slow Boat Lady China, Be yeah. Good, we did, yeah. And Norman Grants is w- watching us, and he was very complimentary, he liked it, didn't he? And yeah. he, I think he liked the fact that, that younger guys were, were doing all this this kind of thing. It's, 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 it was just an amazing experience, that, wasn't it? I've never known anything like it. Do you know, he phoned me the next day, and he went, he said, you've got a great sound, he said, you know, you're going you're gonna to have a wonderful career. He said, you know, if you don't mind me saying, I think you should be playing across all the festivals in Europe. And me being not Mr. Knight, and yeah, great. Can can you book me? And he went, <laughs> well, I think you should probably just book yourself. <laughs> well, was he retired by that time? Yeah, he was probably like eighty then. He was, he was uh, out of it. But the uh, other the other thing, while well, we're because we got so much to talk about, because he's <laughs> uh, this guy sitting next to me, Leo, he's but he's, he's closer than a brother to me. We, we 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 hang out all the time. We tell each other uh, we bitch and moan. <laughs> we tell each other our problems, and I, I love him. He, and, he, and I admire what he does. But he's opened up so many doors for me, and uh, and closed a few. <laughs> Close the view as well, but we're talking about. Well, I've lost my thread, but we were talking about Norman Grants. But yeah. what about the other? Any of the other? Oh, I know. What I wanted to say that we're talking about Benny Green, as, as great as Benny was, because really I, I got to know Leo even even closer when um, Benny had a road show, didn't he? He was going out. That's right. Now, was he writing for the Sunday? I think it was the Sunday Express, Express wasn't it? So say a bit, tell us a bit about yeah, that, what he was, was a, doing, how, I mean, for why years, he got me on it as well. You you know, know. Yeah, people always think of, you know, associating him with jazz and with music and Frank Sinatra, but he was a, he was a, a critic yeah. as well and, and, and would often write columns on film or TV. And he had a column in the, in the Sunday Express reviewing, I think, radio or TV. And someone had the, had the bright, bright idea that perhaps they should send him out on the road every Sunday night around the country in association with the Sunday Express doing a jazz night. So he, he came came home and he, he hadn't been playing very long because he didn't play for thirty odd years. I me and my brother yeah, started. He gave playing. it up, didn't he, yeah. to be an author and a, whatever the presenter. Yeah, and he, and he so he's, he just started playing again. He said, "What do you think? Should, should we do it?" I was about twenty at the time, and by that time he was quite old and a bit ill. So it was it was a nice thing to do with him, you know. And he said, "Okay, let's." So he, he phoned up. Maxine Daniels came and did it. A great guitarist, Gary. Uh, what was his name? Potter. Gary Potter, the Django Rhino. Great. Right. And then he said, "He said, I will do something." He said. Call your mate Ray. Get brother. Yeah, because he guitar. just knew me then, didn't he? Yeah. I barely knew him when I played. Who but else then did it? Richard Bushakevich did it. Richard Bushakevich. Leon Clayton. Uh, John Piper. John Piper did it. Drums, uh, yeah. Bobby. Um, Bob, Bobby Orr and Bobby Worth. That's right. Bobby Orr. Lovely swinging group. Dad would tell stories and we'd, yeah. all, we'd all play. And we did a lot of them, didn't we? What I loved about Benny's thing, though, it, yeah, like, rather, than it, rather than it just being a gig, you know, because a lot of people back then were just doing the, the standards or whatever, but your dad would tell stories yeah. about the people he knew, like Johnny Mercer. Yeah. 
and Norman Grant. That's right. And Lester yeah. Young. And I, I remember your dad being a lovely player. He had, he really had that Lester Young thing down. And I remember he liked what I did because it was a bit. Yeah. He used. To, he, he loved you as well. And he said he always said, "Oh, oh yeah, I know, just Charlie Ventura." And he, yeah. We, we really. I really got to know your dad on those things. I got to know you quite a lot as well. He, he, you know? he thought he was a bad player. He thought he had a very, he very low opinion of himself. He said, "I'm not a natural musician. You know, I don't really." That's very was. strange. I thought he had a great time, great it, sound. You know? Yeah, and he, but then, then what we used to do, he used to put that show on for a, a, like a week at a time at the Pizza on the That's Park. Right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. now, the Pizza on the Park was a venue in High Park Corner. For those who don't know, it's a wonderful cabaret venue. Really, really good wasn't it? room, wasn't it? Yeah. Everybody played there. Blossom Deary and Buddy Greco, yeah. like that. But your dad would do the weeks there, wouldn't That's he? That's right. Well? Yeah. Weeks with, with yourself, yeah. Yeah. And we got caught to do This Is Your Life. That's what we did. <laughs> now, That's right. You're right. We were down there one night, and he, he had no idea that was coming. Let me tell you. Unbelievable. <laughs> we ended up on This Is Your Life. God, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, we're being carted down to the BBC studios to celebrate Benny's life, Benny Green's life. And I remember that... Uh, do, you remember, what, do you remember what time we had to go down there? What time was it? Well, we did the gig, and they, they ambushed him at the gig, and then we had to go... We didn't get it till about midnight, do you not remember? I remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. God, and there was an all still knackered now. And I remember something, your dad says, well, let's open up with whatever it was. And I remember that my saxophone packed up. If you're talking about bad luck and the gremlins... The complete octave smile, was it top, smile, smiles? I think it was smiles. The top end of my saxophone completely packed up, and I'm cracking notes, and, and, and then Ronnie Scott come up afterwards, and he says... <laughs> he was sat next to me. He you. was sat next to me, and Ronnie Scott come up afterwards, <laughs> and he goes, here, well, hello, Ray. He goes, what's that saxophone? So I told him, I said, it's an old con. I said, but the bloody octave, as soon as I started playing, the thing packed up. I said, it was like someone had it in for me, and he just looked at me going, oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> That yeah. was unbelievable, wasn't it? But yeah. still, so, you know what I want to do as well? Is we, we, we talk about, you know, all these kind of stories, but and I want to end it with some of the funny things that you and I have had happen in, <laughs> in between us, like the time I impersonated you. We'll go that in a minute. <laughs> but before that, I just want you to tell a couple of stories about the people. Just, you know, like the, uh, the, the, the Jerry Lee Lewis. Tell us a little, because I know you had some hilarious ones about Jerry Lee. Oh, and you've got to tell them. We, while we're here, you've got to tell them. It was, it was a bizarre... Oh, the whole thing was bizarre. That's all I can say. Uh, from the moment I got the call to do the gig, I'd, I'd done a couple of years with a band called the Big Town Playboys, fabulous rhythm and blues band, and I'd played at this hotel in Wales called the King's Hotel Newport. I they, did they, that. Yeah. Mac used to Mac. run it. So Mac phones me up. Yeah. Hello, son, how are you? Yeah. You know, I said, yeah. He said, i got a question for you, boy. Oh, yeah. He says, uh, have you got long hair? I'll, I'll drop the, the Welsh accent. And I said, so, he said, have you got long hair? And I said, well, not especially, no, why? He said, are you working next Friday and Saturday? I said, no. He said, in that case, he said, I've got a gig for you down at the hotel. He said, I've got an American act coming in. He's asked me to book a sax player, but he's told me no long hair. I said, OK, fine, you know, whatever. He said, it's Jerry Lee Lewis. So I thought, this is fantastic, great. I love him, you know. So I phoned my dad up. I was, I was think I was 19 years old. I just moved out of home. I said, Dad, I said, I've got a call. I'm going to work with Jerry Lee Lewis. Your dad uh, hated rock and roll. He didn't. I, I'll tell you a funny story. And there was a silence, and he went, Jerry Lee, he said, yeah, he said, uh, not the guy with Dean Martin. I said, no, 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 not that one. He said, hang on, he said, something about fiery balls? You know, he's yeah, yeah. Just, I said, that's the one, Dad. He said, yeah, he said, let me know how you get on. Well, anyway, yeah. so I, I travelled out to Wales, and, uh, you know, I didn't I didn't really know what to expect. There was a Welsh, Welsh band there who were backing him. And they're all very nervous. And I walk in, and they're all like, uh, "Are you are you ready?" And I didn't know what was what to expect. And uh, we never met him. We sound checked. Uh, he he turned up about an hour late. Sat at the piano, didn't speak to anybody, and he just started playing. We didn't know what song, what key, or nothing. Didn't he say anything? Didn't say a word. How did he look at that time? He looked shape. To me, he looked like an old man. I right. say that now, but I was 19. Everyone yeah, looked like an yeah. old man. He was probably only about 58, 59. Sure. But he was a 58, 59 year old yeah. who lived a life, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so we played this gig, and to me, it was no different from being in a, in a pub in Emma Limpstead trying to keep up with guys I didn't know, yeah. songs I didn't know. So to me, it was just it was the same old, same old. And uh, I, th I did find myself on the second night thinking, this is a bit, you know, I've gone from in my bedroom playing along to Great Balls of Fire to actually playing it with Jerry Lee. This is crazy. crazy. And then the second night, he kept pointing at me. Blow your horn, blow your horn, kill. Yeah. He called everyone killer. And uh, I just I had a great time. And then the next next night, his wife came up to me and said, listen, 
he hasn't had a saxophone player in the band since Boots Randolph. Wow. He'd you're... love you to join the band. And I, and I, again, naive, went, oh, great, thinking, well, Cardiff tonight, yeah. tomorrow will be Birmingham or Newcastle or Manchester. I said, well, so you've got, we've got some gigs next week in, in uh, San Paolo. And I, I, again, I was, oh, great, lovely, terrific. You know, Where's Sao Paulo? I, I bet you were going to I had no, no idea. idea where it was. So I went home and I packed. <laughs> I go to the airport. I get on this plane for hours and hours. I get out the other end. And I will never forget, I'm sat on Copacabana Beach in a pair of cowboy boots and black trousers. I only took my gig clothes with me. That's how naive I was. I go back to the hotel. I had a knife pulled on me by a kid. Yeah, I remember you I said phone, I phone up. I phone up home. I said, Dad, I said, what's the football results? I was phoning home yeah. for the football results. He tells me, he says, how are you getting on? I said, Dad, it's boiling here. It's baking. I, I can't cope. He said, well, of course, you're in Brazil. I had no idea. <laughs> I, got, I went to the airport. I could have gone to Braintree or Brazil. I did not know. I was so naive. Now, that was a crazy trip. I mean, I, I know we we've only got a few hours. But, no, but, 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 but tell us about the Lewis story, because I remember you said in Brazil with the with the doctor. It, it was crazy. Pursuing him when oh, he went mad. Because we were safe uh, on Yeah, he was on the methadone program, which, for, you know, for people who yeah. don't know, is he had challenges with drugs, but he, he was off all that stuff, but he was just taking it in prescribed form, you know. And uh, It's so, really done him harm while it getting him. He's still around at nearly 90. Well, he's, he's still going. <laughs> Well, what happened? You know, he had all this medication on the trip, and his wife would obviously give him the pills. He got his hands on the pills, as far as I remember, and did did a a ten a ten day supply of medication in the first forty eight hours of the trip. So he went crackers, went poor guy. So I remember I, I came back into the lobby with a couple of the guys. We'd been out for a drink, and he, he was ranting, "You're fired!" He was firing everybody, people that didn't even work yeah. for him, you know. And uh, <laughs> then I remember the next night in his hotel suite. It, yeah. it must have been November because it was Thanksgiving. And we all get invited to his suite for Thanksgiving uh, dinner, and we he says grace, and we all gotta, we all gotta sit quietly and say grace, which you know for me was a, a new thing. And I look up, while well, everyone's got their heads bowed saying grace, and, and and Mr. Lewis is murmuring away, and he's he's wearing his dressing gown. And let's just say this, it wasn't quite done up all the way, and I know that. Uh, he doesn't sleep in pyjamas. We're just going to say well, that. As little Richard would say, let it all hang out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, yeah. And then one night we were on stage and he, he decided he wanted to have a fight on the stage the guitar, during the gig with the guitarist. So he got the, the, the microphone like a lasso was trying to whip him around the head. The guitarist has got his, his, his axe in the oh, air and swinging. But these are two old guys. What did you think about all this? Well, I'll tell you the what I thought. I thought this was hilarious. And then the next thing, chairs start being thrown at the stage and they, they, they start rioting. So we're all crouching down and I've gone behind the drum kit to crouch down from these. They were throwing bottles, they were throwing chairs. He's pushing and shoving the guitarist, and I was laughing. It's like back in the 50s, isn't it? Like I was laughing. Yeah. But what I didn't realise, Ray, is while I'm laughing, I've got a microphone on the end of my saxophone. It's picking up my laughing. <laughs> so that, then, then the, the, like the army guys are coming on saying, no, no, no. You know, and I'm going... <laughs> oh we, were, we were taken off by the army. We had an escort back to the hotel. This was just one night of many crazy nights. I but didn't you say there was a story where he got tranquilised by a dart or something? Oh, yes, that's right. And uh, he yelled, uh, you tell us just quickly that That one. was, I think, the same trip. He, 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 he was crazy, and the doctor came in, and he had like a, it was like a like a tranquilizer gun you might use on, on, a, on an animal in the zoo, you know, and pew! And then suddenly, he just sat down in the chair. Didn't he yodel when he sat down or something? I was always having a yodel. Was, he, he loved it. Yeah, he and I can remember <laughs> saying to Dave Lanyardo, who was the bass player that was with us, I said, Dave, have I just seen what I think I've seen? And Dave just laughed and went, no one will ever believe us. No. Well, we've got the story He said, yeah, I mean... It, I, but I, was I, it, can I be asked, you know, of all these stories, and it's fantastic telling them, because we can't go for every every story, because I think this is probably the, the funniest <laughs> one I've ever heard of all the people you work with. But the point is, was he good? Well, I tell you that, there is was a serious... Was he good at the time? There is a serious side, because yeah. there was all this crazy stuff, but the gig itself was about, I don't know, an hour and a half of songs that I, some I didn't know, hmm. I didn't know what key, like I say. It was an amazing learning ground, and, and it's a lesson, because one minute he'd be, he'd be ripping through High School Confidential yeah. like a punk song, and the next minute he'd be doing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Yeah. Then he'd do Mexicali Rose. It, 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 there was no genre. He wasn't just doing rock and roll. He, it was, there was tunes yeah. from Broadway shows. There was jazz. Georgia you'd do. There was everything. Was, was the voice in shape and all that sort of thing? Reasonably yeah, similar? Amazing voice. Yeah. And the piano sounded like the records to me. It sounded... And one night, we'd, <laughs> we were doing a gig somewhere in, in Sweden. Someone had booked him for a private do. And we were in a Chinese restaurant, and they'd given him a keyboard, like a kid's keyboard. It was like not even yeah, three-quarter yeah, yeah. size. 
still sound like Jerry Lee Lewis. It was unbelievable. Right. And uh, and the drummer had got drunk, the bass player had missed his flight, and it was me and him for about half an hour, just me and Jerry, and Jerry Lee. Lewis. Yeah. And uh, I tell you what, he he, he delivered. How like per on a personal level, how'd you get on with it? Really well. So I know he smacked what's his name, didn't he? He punched Keith Richards. Did he? No, well, I mean, that's he not that's not exactly an exclusive <laughs> club, is it? I mean, <laughs> I yeah, uh, you know, no. but. Uh, yeah, I mean, I got, on, I got on as well as I... I mean, it wasn't a friend. We didn't go out bowling. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I worked for him. He was my boss. But one night we were in uh, in Amsterdam and we were in, a, in probably his hotel suite afterwards having a bit of a, a drink. Everyone was there. And I got talking to him. He said, you're, you're still going, are you? I'm going to check your recording. And I, was ta- and I was talking to him in this hotel suite and uh, he, he was very complimentary. He said, you know... We were talking about Boots Randolph, and I was yeah. asking him what other sax players he would work with. And again, you know, he was a, he, he knew what he was talking about. He knew, he he knew all the players, uh, and he knew we were talking about Junior Walker and, yeah. and some of those guys. And I said to him, I, I said, I hope you don't mind me asking. I used to call him Mr. Lewis. You yeah. Know. Call me killer, but I, I couldn't, you know. And he said, I said, you know, what was Elvis like? Yeah. And he stopped, and I thought, oh, I'm going to get a smack in the head now. Yeah. And he went, he said, we, we were like brothers. He said, I love that man. He said all that stuff in the paper he said yeah I went round his house with a gun yeah he said but and on a lawnmower apparently he said that's on a mobile lawnmower with a gun he said that's what southern boys do <laughs> it wasn't like an act of aggression no. it was like you oh, know, you, very you, nice. you know when, you, when yeah. you were 15 you might have lobbed an egg at your mate's window for a laugh that's what that's the equivalent he said I love that man he said but uh, he said of course we went mad he said what do you expect he said if everyone tells you you're God every day of your life from a teen, he said, "You're going to go mad." He said, "Of course we went mad." He said, "But I miss him every day," and he he talked about him like yeah. you would talk about a, a real friend. And lucky, you know, lucky he wasn't. He hasn't been a Lewis hasn't been really a rock and roll casualty because he's still no, he's still going. I mean, he was gigging up until yeah. the last year or so. That's I mean, sure. the other one you worked with just briefly because we, we uh, was Little Richard, wasn't it? Yeah, you did was, a brief stint with him, didn't you? Yeah, that was in in uh, in Sweden and Norway. It was a package. Jerry Lee and, and Little Richard. I mean, what would I give to go of that as a punter now? Unbelievable. And uh, we did, we, you know, again, there was no rehearsals. We got up and he had, he did have a band with him, but he didn't have horns. So it was me and I think what, a couple of the other guys. And after the gig, I went to see him. Again, I didn't yeah. meet him until after the gig. <laughs> and I went to see him. He ain't little and, either, is he? Seriously? No, he's, he's a, quite a tall, chunky guy. He's quite a chunky guy, a tall guy. And so I, I, I was quite disappointed with the gig because <laughs> he had a guy at the back of the stage on a keyboard doing the high uh, right hand stuff. But he was old, you know. The, yeah. But the voice was incredible. And I went to say thank you very much. And uh, weirdly, all I had on me was my passport. So I wanted him to sign, my, yeah. get his, his autograph. I was a kid, you know. And he said, did you enjoy my show? And I said, yeah, I really did. It's, I think he thought I was a punter. He didn't know who yeah. I was. And he said, did you enjoy it? I said, yeah, I had a great time. He said, would you like my book? And I thought, in fact, of course, I love it, love your book. <laughs> Thinking he's written an autobiography. And he pulled out a Bible. Give me the Bible. So not only is he giving me the Bible, he thinks it's his book. Yeah. He thinks he's written it. So he wrote on my passport, i tell you this, I, he wrote on my passport, dear Leo, yeah. God loves and cares for you. Sincerely, little Richard. Now, of course, I'm panicking, because you're not supposed to really write on a passport. I thought I might get a little squid. That's what he wrote on my passport. Unbelievable. God loves and cares for you. Unbelievable. Anyway. You know, the, the figures with this... The, the, when we were talking here, mate, it's, it, it, it's not about name dropping. You've actually done these things, right? And people it's are very interested. But I just want to know, no, because yeah. you've just tell us. You got to say before we get to a couple of other things. <laughs> I've got to know about the Sinatra, because this man actually met Frank Sinatra, didn't you? Well, didn't that, that was. The, I mean, I, you know, I look I back mean, that's now. An and think, I, I think did that happen? You know, it was. Uh, it was the first time I was really aware that my dad was known to anyone outside the house because I it, you met him he was the most unshowbiz bloke you'd ever meet he was just dad right so I was about 15 or 16 and we'd gone to the Albert Hall to see Frank Sinatra who I was obviously a huge fan of and we were sat in our seats waiting for this show to start and I see this guy walking up the uh, the aisle Bobby Robson who at the time was the yeah. England, England football manager and he was you know he was, it was he was a huge huge name I said, Dad, Dad, oh my, that's Bobby Robson. Is he in the football man? I was a kid, you know. And this guy walks up the aisle, and he comes up to my dad and says, Hello, Benny. I'm thinking, what's going on here? And he says, I, I love the show last week. He said, that, that track you played, I love that album. Two of a kind, he was talking about this Johnny Mercer, Bobby Darren yeah. album. 
I'm thinking, what? Why is the England manager talking to my dad? And that's the first night I thought, hang on, what? <laughs> what's going on here? Yeah. And that night we we sat through the Sinatra show, which was just like I can remember it to this day, incredible. And then Dad says, let's go out. You want to go and say hello? To we have to go back afterwards. You see? So we go back. We're in this room at the backstage of the, at the, at the Albert Hall, and they were all milling around. And suddenly in, in walks Frank Sinatra. It was like it was like being on a movie set. And he came over and he was talking to my dad about um, Jimmy Van Heusen and all these songwriters. And, and he turned to us and he said, uh, he, the dad said, this is my, my kids. And he said, oh, hey kids. He said, uh, I hope you're not giving your old man a hard time. Did he say that? Yeah, and then off he went. Unbelievable. And that was it, yeah. How do you look at the time? Well, again, like I say, everyone looked old to me yeah, then. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he sang incre- I mean, I'm, I'm still... But he was a friend of your dad's, wasn't he? Well, Your he, dad he, ate with him in the 60s, didn't he? And little, yeah, you know, he, he did. He went, went to Savoy and Sinatra all recorded an album in the 60s called Sinatra Sings Songs of Great Britain. It was all British songwriters. I know the album. It's incredible. But things like The Gypsy... And, and Nightingale sang at yes, Square yeah. and wonderful songs. And he asked... Uh, my dad helped him pick the songs. And he'd read some of dad's sleeve notes and said, well, I'd like you to write the sleeve notes for a new album called Sinatra's Sinatra and it was all Sinatra's favourite songs that he'd selected yeah. and he got Dad to write the, the essay that went with it so they, they you know I mean after Dad died we found going through his stuff we'd find you know like a like a letter from Frank Sinatra and, yeah. a, and, a, and, a, and a Christmas card from Peggy Lee it was, uh, well talk, just talk about that while we I mean all, that's incredible for Sinatra it's in your blood all that but you know I don't want to bring this up now but I was at Benny Schroeder or, you know, me too a ter- <laughs> you, you too it's a terribly <laughs> terribly sad affair I, I Played, do you remember? You got me to made play it, with made it, made it worse. <laughs> <laughs> and there was Tommy Whittle, weren't there? Bobby Orr. Oh, yeah, we we played Tommy, the sort yeah. of eulogy for, for Bernie. And uh, in the front row was Tony Bennett. Yeah. He'd yeah. flown over oh. on Concord, which oh, was still. Man. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. He'd it's flown over specially to, to pay respects to your dad. He, he said that. Um, I didn't realise you at the time. I didn't know. He, t- he said to me, if it wasn't for your dad, no one would know who I was over here. He was the first guy to, you know, play on the radio and talk about him and celebrate him, you know. Unbelievable, mate. I remember. I remember. Yeah. We got, but just, just, um, we, we could tell a couple of stories. But there's one I want to tell. We can't say who it is. Recap. Does this mean anything to you? When I say, um, let's go eat pizza with a mafia. What does that mean to you? Oh my goodness me! Can you, you tell see, it? The trouble with you, you is you know too much. I know a lot. And we was, can't. We can't. Leo and I can't make names. B- bizarre. No, I can't t- say who. But no. that was the most. But it's a massive star. Yeah. Go one on. of the biggest stars in the world. Go on. And I don't know how we ended up in this situation. Uh, like I don't know how I ended up in a hotel room once with Jerry Lee Lewis saying grace for, yeah. for, for Thanksgiving dinner all but Richard, I did all little Richard giving you a bite. you know but we were in a situation the back of a taxi with, with a certain uh, incredible star wonderful artist and this artist said to the driver take me to where the, the mafia eat pizza is yeah. that what he said he did it and was the, the three of us and wasn't the weird, it? that's right yeah. the weird thing was do you remember what the driver said he, oh, I know what you mean. He knows what you mean straight away. And it was somewhere in. in West you and London. I were looking at each other, thinking this, this is some kind of setup. And we ended up in, the, in one of those situations again. We can't say who or what. But, no. But there, but I know. I tell you something, Raymond. There was someone pulled a gun someone out. Someone pulled they? a gun out. Not not on us. They just there, showed there, us. There was a, there was a situation, and we had to. Yeah. Not only did we have to get out there, pretty smartish. But you and me had to go back and make amends and, and say our, our we apology did. to some heavy we characters. We did. Do you know why? Be, because the star uh, uh, knew these people. And he was um, drunk, and he lost his. He didn't lose it. He or she, I can't. We can't say. We can't say. But whoever it was, <laughs> lost lost their rag and with we, the people. And you and I, I remember, we had to go back. We, we found out who one of the You're people right. was associated with, and we had to go. Do you remember that? Do you know that we oh, were sitting around Jesus. eating pizza at the upstairs this restaurant? We can't say where it is. We no. can't give too many clues. No, you can't. But it was actually scary. And Leo and I were we were half laughing, weren't we? Do you yeah, remember? Yeah, we were. We were half laughing. And um, the, the, the the star. Um, this wasn't a celebrity. This is a real star, you oh, know, yeah, a proper yeah, star yeah. of the music world. And he um, he lost his kind of rag with these people. And they um, they kept. What I remember was instead of them getting cross and arguing back, they were just it's they okay. were smiling. Do you remember? They were smiling. Don't worry. Yeah. Don't worry like that, right? Then there was a mixture of Italian, British Italian people, and real Cockneys as well. Um, I remember the guy that got the, the gun out and put it on the table. It's actually a very nice guy. He wasn't smiled. He? He's put it out. Just, just put it out. Put it on the table. Yeah. So you. So when did we go back? A week later. We went back a few days later just to sort of say, oh, listen, oh, thanks guys, we appreciate. What that. did they? Did they say they appreciate it? Yeah, we just went back and said, yeah, no. God almighty, no I remember you and I went back. Yeah, what, so let's just. Yeah, oh, we've been through some. We've been through some times. Do you know what, mate? This is probably one of the best podcasts <laughs> I've done. And when people listen to it, I, I don't think they're going to believe it. It's it's unbelievable. But while we we're talking about all that business and. 
and that. But let's see, Leo and I have got a lot of history. We've we've hung out together for years. We've never had a cross word. No. It. We we sit here, smoke cigars, and, and grumble as I've said. But we've also got some funny stories, hilarious stories we've done together. And um, one was, I mean, do you remember when we went to New York together and we saw Illinois Jackets? <laughs> Big band at the tavern on the yeah, green. Yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. And yeah. this idiot and I shared a room. I don't know what you're talking about. Now, I remember we arrived in New York and we got suited and booted to the nines completely, <laughs> and we ended up walking to the tavern on the green on the coldest night I've remembered in my life. Do you remember? Oh, it was bitter. <coughs> it was bitter cold, and we—I don't even think we had enough. We, we didn't prepare for it. And I remember, you know, trying to look smart, stepping off the sidewalk in New York. And stepping on a, it was what I thought was the pavement, it was ice. And my foot went through, <laughs> literally up to well, my wasn't, knee. It wasn't the first time you put your foot in it. Thank you. In freezing water, oh. and I was having to dry, when we arrived at the gig, I was so, I was so Very soaked. Funny. I was having to dry my socks underneath the dryer. You were laughing at me. Very right? funny, yeah, we've had some moments. We've had some moments, so I remember we all, did, but ba- we woke up, we both had jet lag, and this idiot, Leo, he looks at me, he says, can you sleep? I says, I says no, I'm awake like you, you idiot. We ordered a plate of bagels. We did. Smoked salmon and cream cheese bagels. Oh, I remember it arriving. I'd never seen anything like it. No. First or second trip to America. It was a bagel the size of of a, of a wheel on a car. At it? four in the morning, we, we did that. And I remember we was crazy. We were only young. And you <laughs> threw a lump of smoked no, salmon. No, that wasn't me. And it, no. Or I might have. I mean, anyway, thing. this lump of smoked salmon stuck on the ceiling. <laughs> and we forgot about it. It stuck on there and we were laughing. And the next night... That's I was halfway through the night. I thought you'd been attacked by a bat. You <laughs> yeah, this thing splattered on the head. <laughs> there's, a bat, there's a bat in it. But the other funny... I mean, we got a load of funny stories. And I'll get to, to it in, in, in a minute before we have to close off. But there was one that I remember when you called me up. But you said, um, we've got the big breakfast. Do you want to come down and do the big breakfast? <laughs> who, who was, it was Gabby Logan. Gabby Rosett. Gabby Rosett and Chris... Chris Evans, wasn't it? I don't think it was Chris Evans. Wasn't it Chris Evans? It was, uh, who was the guy who took over from him? Does the radio now. Are Johnny you? Vaughan. It was Johnny Vaughan? Yeah. So he, he phoned fun. me up and you said, we've got the big breakfast, we've got to get up at like four in the morning and get there by six or something, and it's Bill Clinton's birthday. That's right. And they want us to play a fanfare on the saxophone. They want us to Bill play Clinton. the national anthem or something. American national anthem American the saxophone. Because he played the saxophone. Double stripes, because Bill played the saxophone. So we went down there. Do you remember? Yeah, they didn't. They were quite. Um, they didn't give us the whole story, did they? They didn't give us the whole story because we thought it was just Leo. Thought it was just me and him, and we were going to link. And what we wanted to do, we were self publicists like we are now. And we thought we'd growl. He says it's great for us, Ray. We'll get our faces on the TV. We'll dance around a bit. We'll play this. We get there. This is before YouTube and the internet. There's only four channels. And how many sax? There was. Like, they'd hired thirty saxophone players. There's a saxophone choir. It was all saxophone choir. And then they, we got this guy handing out parts. Do you remember? We got. Oh. Let's read parts on live TV. Oh yeah, we, I've done this arrangement on the train of it. Oh, blah, blah. And we were really pissed off. Oh, can you remember? So, do you want me to tell the story or what, what you did? <laughs> he, he pulled, you pulled the best stroke I've ever heard. Shall I tell it? You can tell it if you want. All right. <laughs> so what he does, so we're fed up that there's all these other sex role players. And all of a sudden, we had a bit of breakfast, bacon and eggs and whatever, and they're all sitting in this, this uh, green sort of room tent. And Leo walks in. Now, I wasn't aware he was going to do this. And he said, lads, lads. Because we did a rehearsal, we did a bit of filming, <laughs> then it was the fanfare at the end. He says, oh, uh, we're no longer required. We can all go home. We've done our bit. And all the la- all your musicians, you know, typical musicians, go, oh, bloody great. Oh, we can all, because none of us were being paid. Oh, we can all go home. Come on, lads. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can all go. Don't worry. So he winks at me. Everybody leaves. And it's just me and him left. <laughs> I said, we got, we got, we've got the last shot. Then. Come on. What? He, you scammed it completely. It was just you and you I. You and me got the credits. That's right. <laughs> Honking away, I remember. And everybody had gone home. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. I'll tell you what. We're on that side. I mean, we've got a load of these stories, right? But I think my favourite one, because people have always said we look alike. In fact, once yeah. I was playing with you years ago, they always think we're brothers. Years ago, someone came up and they went, what a wonderful saxophone thing. It's father and son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know who they thought was who. <laughs> but t- t- what about the one where I impersonated you on a gig? Yeah, I don't know how that came what about. What happened about that? I, I, I think I was double booked or something. And I said to Ray, you know, you're going to have to, you want to do a gig? Yeah, I'll do a gig for you. What is it? And I didn't tell him till he got, yeah, got there. It was it was a private do, but they expected me to turn up. Yeah, you had booked a band. Yeah. I, I don't so know he phoned I'm... me up and said, "Can you? Um, I've I've double booked myself. Can you come as me? Can you actually right. come?" So I says, "Well, I'll give it a go." So I put my suit on. I turned up, and do you know what? 
nobody was any of the wiser. And I had this woman coming at me, goes, uh, do you know what, uh, Leo? Um, and she looked at me like I looked a little bit older. Because I'm... <laughs> How old are you now? I'm ten years older than you and I. So I'm ten always years old. Always <laughs> And the woman looked at me and she sort of squinted her eyes and went, like, is it really him? Yeah. Uh, and she went, I knew your father, you know. And she's telling me all this family oh, history. Yeah. And I'm just nodding. And I got away with it. Yeah, to this day. I got away with him personally. I wonder if she's yeah. listening now, that lady. Unbelievable, but, way. Uh, so, what, what, anything else? What, what, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'll talk about anything you like. I mean... Um, yeah, it's certainly been busy the last uh, 20, 30 years of the playing and the booking and absolutely, yeah, and, and yeah, doing, yeah, doing other things. You know, I've always I've always believed that you know the phone doesn't ring, you have to get out and do it, and don't wait for anyone. And no, you know, and I think I'm always of the opinion if if I don't do it, someone else will. So if you want to yeah. do the gig, play or whatever, you've got you've got to get out there and do it. Well, we've know? both both pushed forward, you know. But where can they see you now, playing and that sort of thing? You well, know, I'm, I'm always gigging. I'm doing a couple of nights, and I'm doing what am I doing? I'm doing the the Pizza Express. In March, I think it's the 28th or the 26th of that Saturday. We're doing two shows that night, early show and a late show. That that'd be a lot of fun. So we still, we, you know, I still play clubs and and I'm always gigging somewhere. You know. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. You're you're a very self-motivated guy, but what you've got is as well. You've got your dad's. You don't just play. You've got the rack and tur side. I love talking is, about the stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it gives you know so many of these tunes and songs people have heard a million times. But if you if you share the stories of how they came to be, it gives it gives them a different uh, content. You know? and, and you know what? As well, you still you know as, as much as the ups and downs and hardships of this business, and it is hard, because you know I'm it's on the grassroots. It's brutal. It can be a brutal game, and it's not gotten e- easier. But the point is that you, you, you've always retained the love of music. You're always telling, you, yeah. you, and you know what? As well, rather better than what I do, you always keep a lookout for new talent. You know, tr- and yeah, you, I like you always, to, yeah. you know, new new people on the scene, and you've you've kept that love of it, and that's incredible, mate. Honestly, you know, oh. it's incredible. I, I think it's because, like you know, you've said before, no matter who or what you are, where you're going, every gig, every week, every night, it's like starting from the from the start line again. It is. No matter yeah. who you are, what you do, so yeah. you, unless you go at it 110, yeah. percent you're gonna come off second best. And mate, I tell you what, we're, you're still out there, and that's amazing, you know. And still got the, your finger with all these pies, the BBC, and all that kind of thing. But it's been great to have you on this podcast, oh, mate. And uh, he's one of my best friends in the world, this guy. And I, oh, we really hope you've enjoyed it. And I tell you what, we'll do a part two with the uncensored stories. We should do part about, two and three because we've got some <laughs> things we can't really talk about at the moment. Leo, thanks very much, mate. Oh,